Welcome to Feature Docs Podcast. I'm uh, your co-host, Dr. Pedro Mizani. I'm a family physician and the chief clinical officer here at AC Medical. And I am your other co-host, Dr. Lydia Iskander, a leadership intern here at AC Medical and a residency candidate. We also invite you to watch the video version of this podcast by visiting youtube.com forward slash acmedical.org. This is episode number 67, part three of the three-part interview with our special guest, Dr. Mario Mikhail. Dr. Mikhail graduated from Ain Shams University Faculty of Medicine in 2009. He is a lifetime member of AC Medical and he secured a PGY1 categorical IM position in the 2022 match. At an NRMP participating program, which we also refer to them as a pre-match programs. Our previous two episodes, number 65 and 66, uh, focused on Dr. Mikhail's uh, types of clinical rotations that he completed, a personal statement that he put together, the mentorship and the constructive criticism that he received and how to use all of those in, uh, in order to uh, have, a, have a stronger version of, of his uh, application and, and get to this point here to be our guest as now a match physician. Today, now we'll discuss how international medical graduates should spot areas of unfamiliarity with U.S. healthcare culture and how to overcome them, and then all while building a very effective network. It's always good to have you again. So what kind of culture difference did you find that's different from your culture and the U.S. culture in here? So I want to take the minute to thank you both for having me again. So for cultural difference, I believe it's a, it's a very big challenge for international medical graduates coming here to U.S. So Let's start by just the jokes that we have in our countries is different. So you might go to a rotation or something or meet a program director and you try to be funny and make uh, people love you around you. And st- but it doesn't make them love the same way it used to be in your country because our jokes are different, as I said. I think the best way to deal with this is to watch more and listen more and speak less. Some people, especially American graduates who deal with culture, different people, they tend to understand those challenges that come in the face of the IMGs. However, not all the people understand and it might look bad if you say something that doesn't make sense for them. So how I handle this for myself and this might work for others to listen more and to talk talk less. So the other thing that international medical graduates could be unfamiliar with is the uh, the expenses involved in going through this entire process. So cultural differences is one thing, financial expectations is 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 a whole other. So tell me about some of the uh, you know the, the the shocking moments that you had that you had to just kind of catch your breath a moment and be like, okay, wow, I get it. I accept it. Now let me deal with deal it. Deal with it. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a tough one because um, if you uh, compare ourselves uh, coming from countries where currencies are uh, in regard of dollars like 10 times or sometimes 20 times more. So uh, with this coming in mind, it's very, very, very huge challenge to be paying all this out of pocket, especially if you're not working or if you have a family, like in my case. We kind of touched this in the last episode, but I want to reiterate and explain more about how tough this situation is. And the reason I'm trying to say this is, this is a challenge that might look very, very, very hard to deal with during the match process. However, if you compare yourself to the American graduate that graduate with a big, huge chunk of loan, and also they are better candidates i'm saying they are better because not better in regard of personality or in regard of any qualification other than doing the rotations all over the year round and being more familiar with the healthcare system here that push us as imgs to do more hard work and to understand that our situation is not as bad in regard of the financial burden as they are because our loans or our financial burden is just one over 10 of theirs. If you compare the, the chunk of loans, I mean, and if you compare our qualification, then we need to do more rotation and understand the healthcare system more. Without this uh, mentality or mind setting, it's going to be very, very tough to go through the process because it's, it's, it's challenging in many several ways. So 
I went to a medical school in Central America, and uh, when uh, I, I barely had any financial aid when I graduated from undergraduate here in the United States from Cal State Fullerton, I think I had like I five thousand dollars in student loans, and then I went to medical school, and you know there were all these loans. And by the time I got done with medical school, my loan debt was over two hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, and uh, and and I was probably actually a little bit lower than what most U.S. graduates are. And right, yeah. They're probably- I hear I, I hear numbers like five hundred thousand and stuff like this. So it's it's pretty tough. It's huge, and that makes that's one of the biggest reasons why you know the the salaries are a little bit higher because they got to they got to pay these loans back. So from from what you were saying, just kind of piggybacking off of what you're talking about, applying to let's say 200 programs in one specialty, maybe right around four thousand dollars. Applying to 400 of it, maybe right around 7,500, you know, eight thousand dollars. But that's only with a complete application, right? That you should invest in in that many programs, and that's with proper mentorship. But even at that, and let's say that you do clinicals, let's say you you have your membership, you put all of the costs together. Even if you're right around 25. Thirty thousand dollars. You're still just like you said, one tenth, maybe one fifteenth of where the Caribbean graduates and the U.S. graduates are in going through this process. So at least you know when you start residency or when you finish residency, you don't have this huge burden of having to pay back three, four thousand dollars a month just in financial aid. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Madani, for this. And uh, let me uh, quote you. And uh, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, one of the sessions, office hours that we had together, I asked you about the application and the preference for programs. I was doing my homework and trying to study programs to apply to. And you said to me, the more you do apply to, the more you get interviews. Because uh, let's say you applied for how many programs for internal medicine? I believe there were like 570 programs. If you applied to, to 570, your chances in getting uh, 10 or 20 interviews are higher than if you apply to 200 programs, of course. The financial burden is still there. But for me, in my case, I tried to balance it a little bit. I applied for 350 programs. That was like uh, uh, the, the best I could do at that time. If I could apply for the 570, I would do it. But it, it, I, I'm sure some people will say that's a waste of money, that's a waste of energy. But for me, I see that it's it's not a waste of, uh, of, of money. Let, let's, let's talk about that. How many interviews did you get, Dr. Mikhail, if, if you don't mind sharing? Uh, of course. So, so I got 18 interviews. 18 interviews. Would you agree? And congratulations to that. Oh, thank you. Would you agree that if you would have applied, so you applied to 350 programs, if you would have applied to 175 programs, would you have ended up with about half of those number of interviews? Yes, I think so. The more you apply to, the better your chances. It's like, uh, if I didn't apply, what are my chances of getting an interview from a program? Of course, zero, right? It's 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 kind of, you do the work, you, you work hard, but expect the worst. What is sad, though, is when people don't have the right preparation and then they pour in, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in applying to programs with a very weak application, letters from four years ago, five years ago, haven't addressed their red flags. And that's quite a waste of time and money and resources. Of course, that's a different story. But if your application is really good and you put the hard work to make it shine as much as you can, then your best shot is to apply as much as you can for it, of course. Thank you. Dr. Mikhail, you mentioned hard work while you were talking now in in this episode, and I see that hard work is relative and has a quite different dimension for international medical graduates, especially those who need a visa sponsorship. Some may want to put in 12 hours per day to prepare, but also have to work 10 hours to pay the bills. How much work did you have to do and for how long, how many hours per day till today uh, to get into this spot? Well, thank you for asking this question. That's a very, very, very good question. And uh, let me start by mentioning the very first time I met Dr. Madani during the strategy session. Once we have the time frame and plan, the frame for the plan, I start working by preparing myself for the rotation, booking the tickets, booking the accommodations, and also preparing my personal statement and the RSCV during that time. So that by, uh, I think that was in June, by time of the deadline for the application in September, I was more than ready to apply and that everything was in place and ready 
especially with the LORs uploaded. And I wouldn't say that this is something easy to be done because it needs a lot of dedication, a lot of preparation and good mindsetting to handle those. Let's put the financial burden because we spoke about it a lot. So I would say just the, the time management because it's another challenge in itself to be organized, prioritize your plans and things that you need to do. Now, let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about building a network. When I was a senior medical student, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had done my two years of clinical clerkships in the U.S. And unfortunately, I, I made many mistakes. And all of a sudden, November came and I had zero interviews. And, um, you know, I took USMLE late. I didn't get the passing score until November. I don't even know when I applied. It was, you know, probably, you know, I probably applied on time, but it's just, it was an incomplete application. And then I met my future business partner and he kind of asked about my situation and he said, you know, well, I said, well, you know, I really need interviews. And he said, well, I can get you interviews. And, and he was the former chief resident at, at, you know, later on fast forward a few years where I became the chief resident as well. And so then he said, you know, I can get you interviews. And I said, you can't get me interviews. What are you talking about? He said, I can. And so just like that, he got me three interviews at, at three different programs. Now, granted, they were courtesy interviews, right? Courtesy interviews are issues with it, but he still got courtesy interviews. The reason why I'm saying all that is the networking and how effective networking can be. Now, he decided to do that for me because you know, he felt that, you know, I was somebody that wasn't going to make him look bad in the interviews and he's going to put me in front of his friends who are program directors. I'm not going to embarrass him and the rest of my application could support it. But let's talk about networking and how critical it is in this entire process. What has your experience been? Networking is very important. Let's just say that networking is one of the things that I would say as important as the person statement. And let me let me explain a little bit because this statement might sound a little bit tough, but the reason I'm saying this is we are virtual now. Interviews are being through cameras. People doesn't know us. And having those connections and networks makes you look like you are a person that are are probably a good person that can make a connection with somebody that can recommend him. Because if you recommend the wrong person, as a candidate or as a resident yourself, it will make you look bad in front of the program director or, uh, or other core residents. So if you are a resident and someone approached you to recommend him to, for your program, you will make sure that this candidate is good enough to make you look good, as you mentioned before. You also touch it base about the courtesy interviews. And uh, let me just say a few words about this because courtesy interviews, as you said, are have some drawbacks about them. And I agree with you a little bit, but I bet to disagree. And the reason I'm saying this is because an interview stays a possibility of a match, even if it's a courtesy interview. And some people, they tend to see courtesy interviews as if they are bad thing. However, I think it's a good thing because you wouldn't get a courtesy interview if your application is not good, if your personality is not good, if, you, if the person that's recommended recommending you doesn't trust you. And if you don't get the, the right person to recommend you, because not everybody can recommend or can get you an interview. It depends on how good he is in relation of other candidates and in relation to the program director himself. So it's a, it's a very complicated thing. But at the end of the day, it requires a lot of dedication and a lot of communication skills to build those networks and also needs a lot of time too, a lot of energy. So you, you can build a network in one day or two days. It needs a long time relationship so that you can ask for it or uh, get it so yeah it's a it's a very tough and uh, challenging thing but it, it works at least for me it got me at least five interviews thank you thank you for this information dr michael how about the social media network like how to build network through social media can you please talk more about that to us sure of course so for social media i think when you study the program you do your homework you go to the residents that looks like you or come from your medical school from your country or you studied with them for preparation during the usmle you can try to approach them through the social media and the way you should do this or at least the way i did it is by finding them on the social media let's say facebook or linkedin and then shoot them a message just a short and sweet message saying that you're graduated from them from the same medical school 
or you need their advice. And then you will build this connection. And after a while, you ask for advice. And for sure, you never ask for getting interviews because it's against the rules. And um, I'm sure this approach will not work because it it look it makes you look bad. You just ask for advice, and then they will offer if they like you or if they see that your application stands out and might have a chance in their program. Yeah, and you know I want to give a little bit of pearl of wisdom on by following what you're mentioning. I think a really um, important thing for candidates to do is to go open up your Facebook page, open up your LinkedIn understand the difference between all of these different platforms start taking a look at your photos that you've uploaded and take down those that like if you were at a nightclub and you had bottle service or you know somewhere where you're around a bunch of your friends and you know everybody's just acting crazy just take those down and what it should be is at least for medical residency medicine is very conservative and so you want to kind of keep it conservative and it's got to be a snapshot of you being in the trenches of just being ready for being an internist. And I think the type of articles that you reshare says a lot about your commitment to the specialty that you're applying to. But that also what it does is that, let's say that you know you don't know whether you're gonna apply to pathology or internal medicine or pediatrics, but doing it this way, looking at your profile from a, from a selection committee's perspective, if you're posting things about peds and you're posting things about pathology and you're posting things about surgery, how do you think they're going to feel? They're going to feel that you don't really have any direction. If you continue to consistently post about things that are about the specialty you're applying to, now you're starting to build your medical brand. Now you're starting to look interesting to people that are going to be interviewing you. And if you think that programs do not go on your social media to check, think again. I can't tell you how many times our members come back to us and they told us during the interview process, They've actually asked about their, their LinkedIn profile, about their TikTok, about their Instagram, about their Facebook, just crazy things. And so one of our members, one of the things that she did, and it's actually one of our episodes that we have over here uh, that we posted on Future Docs, she got into pathology and, and she spent a few weeks getting her LinkedIn page and her Facebook ready. And her profile picture was her looking through a microscope. Wow. Right? How cool is that, right? And she's applying to pathology. And so you could kind of see her face, you know it's her, but you, she's getting ready to get on you know, behind a microscope. And I thought that was very, very clever, right? Um, that, that really shows commitment and it really helped her a lot. And so for everybody, it's going to be a little bit different. Check your grammar, you know, spelling, when you're posting, all these things make a difference. And ask for advice. One of the things that you could do as a, as a member of AC Medical, if you have any questions with regards to your, with regards to your profile page, you know, Come over to one of our office hours and we'll we'll discuss it and we'll bounce ideas off of each other and and see uh, how your profile page looks at least you get a third perspective a third party perspective about uh what, what at least what i feel about it and, and other ac medical colleagues so dr mikhail i really want to thank you for you know giving us your time for this three-part series interview you've been awesome to work with I'm so honored to see you before the match, watch you through the entire match process, through all of our ups and downs, mostly ups, and uh, now fantastically up, 18 interviews, matched into a program that did not participate in NRMP. They wanted you right there, and they made the offer, and you had to choose not just between them, but but you know several other programs, and it was tough. And so I appreciate you trusting AC Medical. I know it took a lot. There's a lot of advice out there. There's a lot of great alumni from your school, but but to be able to come here and be here and, uh, and, and volunteer time, it really means a lot to us. And so in the future, if you have any topics that you want to discuss, you're more than welcome to be a, you know, our, our, our guest over here. And please don't hesitate to come over and, and, uh, and uh, co-host with us again. Thank you, Dr. Madani. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me today and uh, really appreciate you during the session. Everything you did, every advice you gave me, I think uh, I would have I wouldn't have done it or be here without your help. So I really appreciate you. Well, thank you. And AC Medical, you know, there are several people that 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 work there all behind the scenes, and you know, it's just uh, it would be impossible um, for 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 me to do what I'm doing without without the, the help of my colleagues, all of our interns like Dr. Eskandar over here. You know, so I, I really appreciate uh, uh, all of them as well. Thank you again, Dr. Mikhail, and thank you, Dr. Mizani. To our watchers, if you haven't done so already, please watch or listen to episodes number 65 and 66 
Also, if you are listening to this podcast, be sure to watch the video form on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash AC Medical Org. For questions or comments, email our producers directly at podcast at acmedical.org or visit our website at acmedical.org. And thank you for your time and see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Mika. Thank you, Dr. Iskander. Thank you to all of our listeners and watchers.